welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. I'm going to get down on my knees and pray. I need God. You need God. So come on, stand to your feet and let's go before the Lord. <clears throat> Father, <clears throat> we thank you so much as we come boldly before the throne of grace, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We're grateful people that we have come to hear from the teacher of the church who is the Holy Spirit. Welcome Holy Spirit, touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us, direct us, and motivate us to be all that you would have us to be. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, give you the glory, give you all the honor. We thank you, Father, as you bless us tonight. We're going to walk out of this place different and with greater understanding than ever before. And Father, we just thank you for a move of your spirit in our hearts and our lives. We thank you, Father, that you're not only going to bless us tonight, but you're going to bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are brothers, there are sisters, and Lord, we give you the praise and give you the glory. So bless them as you would bless us, and Lord, we'll give you the praise and glory in Jesus' mighty name. With a great big shout, we all say amen. amen. Well, I just want to take a, a moment or two and just, if I can, review with you just some things that we can understand. We're talking about controlling the carnal mind, and <clears throat> I think it's important for us to see that all of us, the word carnal, remember from the very beginning is the word we get carnality from. We get the word in the Bible called the flesh. We get the word physical. We get the word, if you will, members. Anything that's physical that controls your thinking, controls the spirit of God that's inside of you. Anything that's physical that comes along. Oftentimes, our, even our own senses tell us to do things a certain way. We've been trained to follow those senses and instead of following God and it seems right and it looks right and it feels right but it's not always right and so we're learning how to control the carnal mind and if you just for a few moments let me review with you this all started if you remember we talked about it <clears throat> if you will back in the garden back at Genesis second chapter when God created man he tells him he says you know you can partake of all the trees that you want, all the fruit that's available to you in the garden, but the one tree in the midst of the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and of evil, and that would be in Genesis, the second chapter, verse 17. He says, do not partake, for when that day comes, you will surely die. He knew better. His relationship with God was on based on God. God directed him. God was his, if you will, God was the one that kept him. God was the one that provided for him. God wanted to bless him. God loved him. God wanted to build him up. God wanted to strengthen him. Just like he does with you. He wants to take care of you and provide for you. Loves you and wants to minister and meet your needs. Wants, here's the best way to describe it. Wants the very best for you. Can you imagine God in heaven, creator of the heavens and the earth, creates you and wants the very best for you. Well, the very best for you is oftentimes not letting you do what you think is best. Oftentimes, it's not doing what the world says is best for you. Oftentimes, it's not what your checkbook says is the best thing to do. And oftentimes, it's not what we feel, it's what God really says. So here's Adam and here's Eve, and they're being directed by God in everything. Now, a lot of times people have a problem with that. It's like, are they brain dead? Do they not have any choices for themselves? Uh, what kind of people are these that just follow God? They were created to follow God. But they also had obviously a free will that they could make a choice themselves because they chose to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil when they were told not to do that. So they had a choice. There was great intelligence between Adam and Eve because if you'll remember that God brings him all the, the, the birds of the air and all the animals upon the planet. I don't know how many species there are, probably thousands, and he names all of them. So he is working his life in conjunction with what God is saying and what God's doing. 
He's not by himself. He's not determining how life goes by himself. He's not out there on a limb, you know, making his own decisions. He's working with God all the way through this. So a lot of times we get a picture that if God wants us to follow him, that we're some kind of a, if you will, a clone, some robo-clone that God made. That's not what Adam and Eve was. He was a partner in love with God. And he was called by God to follow God. When he failed to follow God by choice, let me say it again. He failed to follow God by choice, then he finds the relationship with God breached. And now all of a sudden, that sin of choice, that sin of decision, is passed on to each and every one of us. And we govern our lives, oftentimes, most of the time, let's be honest with each other, based on what we think, what we feel, what we have decided, what society does, what people do around us. We base our whole lives, we get our direction, we get our insight, we get our decision-making process, all based on the flesh. You see? And that is not complementary to working with the plan of God. If, if I can give you an illustration of that, it might make it simple for you. Let's say for an example that you were a manufacturer of great motors. Motors that generated something, made something work, power, energy, or something. You created, manufactured a great motor. Inside the motor, to, in order for it to produce, you have a handbook and you have a manual on how whoever purchases a, these, one of these motors from you is to operate it. The person purchasing the motor comes along and, and says, wow, this is a great motor. It's going to last for such a long time. It's just fabulous. It's just, you know, just perfect. It's everything I've ever wanted but decides to run the motor the way they want to, contrary to the handbook, contrary to the manual. So all of a sudden, instead of putting in a certain kind of fuel that runs this motor, they put in a fuel that runs the motor. And they're saying, wow, this fuel's better, this fuel's cheaper, this fuel I, I, I can get, uh, it doesn't cost me so much. But they didn't realize that the studies had already been uh, done on that motor and that now that fuel causes the motor to run a little hotter, causes the pistons to fire a little bit more, causes the crankshaft to have a little more weight and energy on it. And all of a sudden, without understanding, all of a sudden the motor eventually runs out and, and fails. You go back to the banner. The person that bought the motor from you comes back to you and says to you, wait a minute, you bought this. It was guaranteed it was going to be great. It was going to be wonderful. And I ran it for a while and it and just fell apart on me. And you went to check it out and realized the guy was putting in this certain kind of fuel and it ruined the motor. So what he did is he operated on his own to try to get the results of the manufacturer. And when we operate on our own trying to get the results of the manufacturer, the motor runs out prematurely and life doesn't work as well as it could have. And that's the sad part about living by the natural world instead of living by the spiritual world. Jesus Christ comes now and brings us back to a relationship with God so that now we can get back into the manual and find out how to live life the right way so the motor keeps on producing. Is anybody understanding that? So Adam and Eve were in this spot, if you remember, where God told them, here's the manual. Here's what not to do. Let's take a look at it in Genesis, the third chapter. Let's look at verse number one in Genesis, the third chapter. Uh, and I'm just going to just start sharing with you some principles out of, these, out of the word of God. Because this is how you and I all got started. Got caught up, remember, in the flesh. This is why we make decisions out of the flesh. This is why we can't lose weight. This is why we can't uh, stop bad habits. This is why we're addicted to things all the time. It's all because of what happened in the garden. Someone said to me not too long ago, I'm not sure I believe in the sins of the parents passing along to the kids. Oh, well, well then you don't believe in Adam and Eve having a problem. If you don't know it, the same problem they had is passed on to you. 
That's a perfect illustration of it. And then tell me how it is that your one and a half year old always wants to stick something in a plug when you tell them not to. Has anybody ever had a one and a half year old? They'll find every hole with electricity in it they can find. Do you know what I'm talking about? You don't have to teach your kids to be bad. Is that not true? Why? Because it all came from the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. Now we don't need God to tell us what to do. We don't need the manual on how to live life. Here's what we know how to do now. We'll put in whatever power we want to put in. Whatever seems logical to us, even though it'll burn the engine out and ruin the whole thing. Is anybody following me? So here we are in the third chapter of Genesis. It's kind of, kind of interesting. And it says, and now the serpent was more cunning than all the beasts of the field and the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. And then verse number three, but of the fruit of the tree in which is in the midst of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. This is the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. Before the partaking of that, all the knowledge that they needed to make the right decision was found in the manual, God himself. Now they have an idea on their own how to do their own thing. They're putting in their own fuel into the motor. They're putting in their own ideologies and own philosophies and own ways of doing things. How did they get that? They got it from the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. These were intelligent, working together people. They were probably more brilliant than anyone could ever imagine. And yet with their free will choice, they chose to do what was wrong and partake of the tree of knowledge of good and of evil. And at that moment, they realize, listen to this, their eyes open up and they see something. They see that they can make the decisions on how the motor runs and they can put anything they want into it. Is anybody following me at all? And the influence of the tree has gone on for years and generations and generations and generations to the place where we live our life according to what we feel, think, smell, touch, or taste. Or what we see instead of what God says. Before that is what God said. So he, she goes on and says, this, well, at least we die. And the serpent said, woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will know how to have your own manual. You can now create and put anything you want into the motor. You can make decisions on how the motor ought to run. And for a while, the motor runs really good, have you ever noticed? But then it bombs out. Verse number five, and comes along and says, uh, it says, you'll know good and of evil. Verse number six, so then the woman saw that the tree was good. The woman saw. All of a sudden, here comes the senses into this. All of a sudden, here comes her own thinking into it. She's not just hearing the voice of the Lord following God. Now she's seeing for herself. She hadn't even partaken of the tree yet. She is now just thinking about it, and she sees for herself. Have you ever noticed before you sin, you think about it? Let me say it again. Before you sin, you don't just sin. The Bible says that sin, that lust entertained breeds sin, and sin breeds death. And you'll find that in the first chapter of James. That lust entertained, in other words, you've got something you're thinking about that's in your mind that's rolling around and rolling around and rolling around. It won't be very long before you're in it. You know what I'm talking about. And here she is. She's starting to think about what she's going to do. Instead of casting it down, instead of getting rid of it immediately, she starts to see it. And, and, and she says this in verse 7. says, the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eye. There's pleasure coming from what she saw. It looked good to her. Let me tell you about sin. Sin always looks good to the person who does it. The Bible makes it very clear that when you operate in something contrary to the ways of God, it'll always be fun and it'll always look good for a while. Then it comes and gets you like a snake. Is anybody listening? <clears throat> she saw with her own eyes and the tree was desirable and made one wise and she took of the fruit and ate and she gave it to her husband with her and he ate. 
pretty bizarre happening. From that point on, now they're making decisions. Now the manual for how to live life, how to have a great marriage, how to raise great kids, by the way, their kids murdered each other right off the bat, how to have a great relationships, how to develop things, how to be prosperous in every area of their life. Everything now comes from their own decision-making process instead of the one who wanted to bless them with everything, God himself. Now I want you to know something. Can I ask you a question? Would you much rather get directions from yourself or from God who created the heavens and the earth? The bottom line for all of us, you'd have to be stupid to answer any other way. I want to know what God says. He knows the ins and outs of everything. He knows how to do it. Listen, if I'm going to do business, let me do business with the greatest Jew that ever walked on the planet. They know how to do business. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And I, 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 I want to know what they have to say. I want to know what God has to say. I don't want to know. See, the problem with it is I've chosen all my life because of the knowledge of the tree of good and of evil. So all of a sudden, we see something taking place. Then as Jesus comes, sets us free so that we can now get back to the word of God and do the word, gives us the power of the Holy Spirit in order to live past what we think and past what we feel and get into what God says, which is very spiritual. That's why it says in Romans, in fact, I'm going to pop it up on the overhead. In Romans, the 12th chapter, verse number one, let's read it together. Watch these words. They are so cool. It talks about you. Watch this. Romans 12 chapter. I beseech you. The word beseech means I beg you. The Holy Spirit's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, it's the Holy Spirit begging you and I to get a hold of this. Watch this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you do something. Watch this. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Did you know that I'm here but my requirement is that my body be sacrificed. In other words, I can no longer live by what my flesh says. I've got to live by what the Spirit says. Yeah. Is anybody following? Uh, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, this is not a big deal. You don't get patted on the back. You don't get brownie points with God when you live your life uh, in, in this manner, holy and acceptable unto God. And you can do it. He wouldn't tell you to do it if you couldn't do it. Now he comes along in verse number two and he makes this statement, watch this. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Now I want you to hear this. Be transformed by the renewing of your minds. I thought I would be transformed by the renewing of my spirit. It doesn't say that. By the renewing of my mind, my thinking has now got to get in line with what God says. Do you remember the part that we said, well, it says, and prove it. In other words, I have got to have my mind renewed. Don't be conformed to the world. Don't be like the world. Don't follow the world. But be transformed. How? By the renewing of my mind, listen to this, that I may prove what is the good and acceptable perfect will of God. Adam and Eve couldn't do that. But I can because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of me. Remember this, what we talked about last week. In fact, let's go back two weeks. Remember the story? Did I tell you this or was it some other place I was teaching? I don't remember. They kind of all work together. Tell me, did I tell you the story about the Indian folklore thing about the, the Indian guy that has two dogs on the inside of him? Yes or no? I didn't tell you that? This Indian guy was a Christian. He was telling a, a young man in his family, he said these words to him. He says, he says, being a Christian is like having two dogs on the inside of me. Who said that, I told you? Well, I'm glad you went. Shut up, Robin. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to all the rest of the people. <laughs> Jeez, what should I do? Stop right in the middle now because you Robin heard this? <laughs> Will you control her, Fred? So... <laughs> so he says to this young man, he says, it's being a Christian is like have two dogs on the inside of you. One powerful, mean dog, and one powerful, and, but kind and sweet dog. And the young man says to the Indian, he says to his friend, an older Indian man, he says, listen, then which dog wins? He says, the dog that I feed. Whichever dog wins is the dog you feed. Inside of you is like two dogs. You've got 
the left side, you got the right side. Whichever one you feed is the one that's going to win. Are you following me? We found out that you're a three-part person. Remember this from last week? Body, soul, first, first Thessalonians 5, 23. Robin, I hope you're not mad at me. I just, I've known her for about a billion years. She's like my sister, you know, so I can, I can play with her. Some of you say, oh, she's really, really rude to that woman on the front row. She's not. She's like my sister, okay? Oh, goodness. So anyway, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 says these words. He says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely with all, listen, spirit, soul, and body. Remember, we're body, soul, and spirit. You're made up of three parts. Would you keep her quiet? Uh, would you keep her quiet on the front row, Fred? Would you slap her? I'm like her sitting in the back right now. We're made up of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And then I said something to you. Do you remember what I said to you? Any two of the three parts overshadow the third. Let's put up uh, number 10. Let's put up page number 10. Remember page number 10, we found that uh, there's three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Any two that... Uh, that uh, work together. For an example, if my spirit works with my soul, then my body gets voided out. There's no power there. If my body works with my soul, but the body can't work with the spirit. Remember Galatians 5.17. Let me just pop up. Can you split screen that or do one of them or, or something? Let me just see if we can find something with Galatians 5.17. In fact, just go to the next page and I'll, I'll go from there. Go to page number 11. So the body, the soul, they work together. That's the flesh, the carnality. And it says the mind, will, and emotions, if that works together, it voids out the power of the spirit. So if my mind, and when he says be transformed, don't be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, my mind's got to get off of what my flesh says and get on what the spirit says. Because if my mind stays on what the flesh says, my spirit loses out. And so what we find here is a wonderful situation. Listen to this. So if you could keep up the verse, I don't know if you can do this or not, John, and then let's go back, if you will, to soul and spirit uh, working together, voiding out the power of the, of the body. So here's the soul working together with the spirit. Now my mind is working together with my spirit and it voids out the power of my flesh that tells me what to do. Now you say, well, why doesn't the body and the spirit work together? Notice what it says in the verse fifth, uh, 17 of the fifth chapter of Galatians. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And those are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Have you ever tried to do something in the spirit and never been able to do it because the flesh conquered you? That's what it's talking about. So that you do, you do not, not me, you and I together, you do not do the things that you wish to do. Remember Paul in the seventh chapter made it very clear. He said, man, I have things that I want to do that I know I should be doing, I don't do because, you know, there's another uh, 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 principle, a law on the inside of me, a law of my members of my sin on the inside of me that just frustrates me and I can never do what I want to do. So he comes along. So the body and the spirit fight against each other. Do we have anything that indicates that back there? Let's go to number 15. Let's just do 15, uh, and that'll show it. So here's the, the body and the spirit. They fight against each other. They cannot work together. When you try to get them to work together, you end up doing nothing. But if I can get my thinking being transformed by the renewing of my mind, if I can get my thinking lined up with what the spirit of God says, it breeds inside of me life. But if I have my mind working with my body, it breeds inside of me what? Death. Yeah. So my marriage fails. My, my children fail. Everything fails. Every diet I've ever tried fails. Every, every thing that I've ever tried to get off of, I've never been able to win. I've, I've never been able to lose. How do I do this? How do I get into this? And then you find a lot of comfort in people that are just like you who are living their lives trying to do something but never can get it done when in fact God gives us an open door to do it. And it's really a shame that we would just stop our whole lives and do things that we don't have to do. Adam and Eve didn't have to partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil. All they needed to know in life wasn't what they decided, but what God decided. The manufacturer had already worked out the conditions of the engine. They came along, bought the engine, and now wanted to change it and wondered why when it broke down, why it didn't work well. 
And so you and I have got to be a people who are having our, don't be conformed to this world, the Bible said, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. <clears throat> Without an understanding of that, then we wonder what in the world we're doing. How do I renew my mind right there? If the Spirit of God is on something like the Word of the Lord, then my mind has got to go to it. If my mind is to it, I will defeat eventually the body, the flesh that rises up and says, I want you to do it. It's hungry and thirsty. Do it its own way. And then, guess what? Then if my body and my soul work together, then it breeds death. And guess what? The spirit is voided out and I lose. Now, someone says, well, how do I do that? Let's take a look at it real quick. Last week I quoted it to you, but I want to show it to you. Is that all right? So let's go and let's take a look at 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, starting in verse number 3. 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Remember, this is the word of God that helps you to find out how to do life. You're going to live here on this planet. You're not going home yet. And while you're here, you want to be successful. You want to be prosperous. You want your marriages to work. You want to be healthy. You want to live victoriously. You want to be a good witness. And for this to happen, you're going to have to get out of the flesh and get in the spirit. You're going to have to go not to the right side, but not to the left side, but to the right side. Let me ask you a question. You understand what I mean by left side, right side? Pop up verse 15, I mean page 15 again. If I have a fight with my wife and I stay in the flesh with my wife, guess what side I'm on? Left. If I now get back into the Word of God and find out what the Word of God has to say and operate even though I'm as angry as a snake in a bag, and operate according to what the Spirit of God and the Word of God has to say, guess what? Can I tell you something? What side am I? Right. This is why every marriage fails right here. This is why every child goes astray right here. This is why every business fails. Every temper is blown out of proportion. This is why everything that you've ever done in your life that you have failed at is simply because of that process right there that's before your eyes. Because if you had hooked your mind into what God said and stayed with it, God would have blessed it. Now stop thinking about it. You mean to tell me, Pastor Jim, God doesn't like independent thinkers? You mean to tell me that if I'm a person that... Uh, as a self-starter, and I personally achieve something on my own, that that is, 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 is not pleasing to God? Can I tell you something? The Bible says you will never please God if the works comes from your flesh. Don't care how successful you are. But here's what we do in our society. We reward anybody who's a personal achiever, don't we? So our thinking is lined up immediately to the left side. If you've been saved and got saved when you were 40 years old, you had 40 years of conditioning that the left side is the right side, is the right way. If you were 30 years old when you got saved, you had 30 years of thinking the left side is the right way. It's only now that you get saved in a few years as being a Christian that you find out, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, your mind right side's got to hook up with the spirit, and that's the right thing. We have been rewarded all of our lives for personal achievement, and all of a sudden, God's not against personal achievement as long as he is in it. When he is void of his presence and you did it yourself, you're on your own. The motor will last for a while and run real good and it'll be economic and you'll think you put it all together and then the motor stops and you wonder what happened. Have you ever wondered why rock stars and movie stars and people with billions of dollars and hundreds of millions of dollars go out and kill themselves? Because the motor ran for a while the way they wanted it to run and it felt good and looked good and had success and then the motor crashed and they didn't have a manufacturer to go back to. <laughs> this is it. This is everything in your entire walk with God is going to be successful if you're right side and fail if you're left side. 
And so you can come in here tonight and hear it, walk out of here and say, well, that's why I gave you a bookmarker. You ought to every day think about it. And every day when someone ticks you off, <laughs> have you ever noticed there's always every day somebody that's going to bother you? Yeah. Huh? I mean, there's always somebody that's not going to do what you think they ought to be doing, acting like they ought to act, being real stupid. I love this. When you're married, your right side, their left. And you know it. <laughs> and it isn't very long before Adam follows Eve. Do you know what I'm talking about? We have a tendency to follow each other. So she partook of the fruit. Now guess what? She's left side. I guess I'll go left side. You know what I'm talking about? Or the same way with a, with a husband. He's left side, I'll go left side. Listen, when you stay right side, you win. See, every day, if you ever notice, iron sharpens iron. God will bring people across your path that just simply bug you. And you have an opportunity and a right, and you can justify your actions. By going left. But if you stay right, you got God on your side. If you go left, the motor's going to heat up and crash early. And you're going to fail. Is anybody listening? So God's not looking for brain dead people who don't want to be rewarded. Your reward has got to come from God because you brought God into the scene. Can I ask you a question? The Bible makes it very clear in Galatians. says, what have you got that you didn't get from God? I mean, the bottom line, you got to have that attitude. I don't care how smart you are, cute you are, talented you are, how gifted you are. What have you got that you didn't get from God? You got to have that kind of an attitude. The attitude is, man, what I have, I got from God. Where I'm going, God's leading. What I do, God told me to do. God's on my side. You got to take God into this thing with you. You can't do it and then ask God to come along for the ride. You're made in His image, He's not made in yours. It's like the motor coming up and saying, listen, manufacturer, you messed it up. We've decided we're doing better without you. Mm hmm. Is anybody listening? Now, when you're in a battle, anybody ever been in a battle? Did you know that every fight you're in is not a physical fight, but a spiritual fight? Uh, are you listening? All right, so you're in a battle. Let's take a look at this. 2 Corinthians 10, chapter verse number 3, pop it up and over it. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Wait a minute. So we live in the flesh. You can't get rid of, does anybody know you can't get rid of the flesh? Huh? You can't get rid of the flesh. I mean, you're in the flesh. You're going to get rid of the flesh when you die and go to heaven. In the meantime, you still have the flesh to deal with. It doesn't go away because you went right side. It's still there nagging at you, telling you to put the wrong oil and the wrong fuel in the, in the machine. He says, for though we walk or live out life in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. you got a battle coming that's going to bring you to the left side. There's a war going on for mankind with Adam and Eve, and she blew it. Truly blew it. Next verse comes along. It's a fascinating verse. Watch the verse. Listen to this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. In other words, you're not going to win the battle through the flesh. So you might as well get out of the flesh. And that's the problem right there. We try to bring the spiritual in with the flesh. It doesn't work. Have you ever had a fight and you're quoting scriptures at each other as you're fighting? Am I the only one that's ever done that? I live with Isaiah the prophet's sister. I know it, what it's like. You know what I mean? You're quoting scriptures at each other as you're fighting. What you're doing is you're bringing the flesh and the spirit in and they don't work together so that you can't do anything. Remember Galatians 5.17. The weapons. There's weapons involved in every battle you'll ever have. Look at it. There are weapons 
There are weapons to fight a battle with. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. What does that mean? Mighty in God has got to be left side or right side? Oh, man. Help me, God. I'm going left side with these people right now. Let's try that again. Mighty in God is either left side or right side. That's better. So in other words, he's telling me if I'm going to have a weapon and I'm going to fight a battle, I better be on the right side. You know, that's where my soul is lined up with what the Spirit of God has to say or the Word of God, which is spiritual. But mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. See the word strongholds? Do you know what the word strongholds really means if you look it up? It's your mental battles that go on. Did you know that? Strongholds is what you got upstairs in your mind and in your thinking that you process to get you to a place where you're ticked off all the time. Stronghold. Strongholds, you're, you never got mad until you start thinking about it. You never got angry until you started thinking about it. You never got hurt until you started thinking about it. That dirty, rotten sucker. <laughs> Didn't that to me? All, all of a sudden, you know what that is? It's a stronghold. And we're held oftentimes by our thinking up on top. And we add the flesh to it, which defeats the spirit. And you can quote the scripture all you want until you do it. Be, don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by how? The renewing of my what? My mind. Not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of your thoughts that are contrary to the ways of God. That's what it just said. Verse number five comes along. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God would be on what side? Let's try it again. The knowledge of God would be on what side? So when something comes against the knowledge of God, which is on the right side, it's got to come from the where? The left side, and it's coming through a process of my thinking. Because you see this? Cast down arguments. You know what that means? Get it out of your thinking. Now he comes along and exposes the whole thing. Watch this. Listen to this. He says, bringing every... What's that next word? Wait a minute, bring in every what? Thought. I didn't hear you. Thought. Bring in every what? Thought. What is that? Thought. That's your mind, that's your thinking, that's your soulish process. Remember, James tells us lust entertained, our evil thinking, our carnal thinking breeds sin. Sin births death. It all starts with what you're putting your mind on. The guy goes out and says, I don't know what happened to me, man. I just got drunk. No, you didn't. You thought about getting drunk. <laughs> I don't know what happened. You know, I just can't give up that dope. I like to smoke weed every now and then. Can I tell you something? It's because you're thinking about smoking weed all the time. <laughs> You know, wait a minute, Pastor, you don't understand, man. I like pornography. It's really good. My wife doesn't treat me well. Guess what? Maybe you've got on the right side, she'll start treating you well. I'm meddling in your problems right now, aren't I? I'm, 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 I'm getting too personal right now. But it says this, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring every thought... Do we bring every thought, heck no, into captivity? To what? To the obedience to Christ. Do we bring every thought to the obedience of Christ? Heck no. We continue the evil thought to the left side. 
And it won't be very long before it voids out the power of the Spirit and your marriage fails and your children fail and your finances fail and your love affair fails and your kids see you as hypocrites and all of a sudden you say, man, I go to church all the time. I ain't even tithe, but I, I've seen by my kids aren't, they, you know why? Because you aren't holding hands. You're not love. You're not kissing. Grandpa, I mean, my husband's not grabbing some bun and husband and wife are liking it. They're you know, touching each other all the time. Come on, let's get real. That's why we have no kids under five here. <laughs> Your kids need to see dad grabbing some little butt here and there. It's good for them. They go, oh, yeah, oh, dad, yeah. Guess what? They can hardly wait to get married and have a great marriage themselves. <laughs> but if they see dad and mom fight all the time after they get out of church, then we wonder what happened. You went left side instead of right side. Somebody just needs to love you enough to tell you the truth and stop messing around with your brain. You want to play church? Go find a church that'll play with you. You need somebody to tell you the truth. We never thought into the captivity and the obedience of Christ. And then there's something that most people don't know. Verse 6, which is a great verse. Touched on it. And being ready to punish all disobedience. Being, don't let it get away with that. When something is contrary to what you're believing for, don't just let it happen so it happens again. <laughs> That's what it says. And being, I didn't write this. If I wrote this, I'd collect the royalties on this. Man, I'd be like a zillionaire. I'd share it with all of you. <laughs> and being ready to punish all disobedience. When? When do you punish? When your obedience is fulfilled. When you finally got back on track, you're solid and healthy going and then you punish. Your flesh rose up and you get in there and you quote the word, you speak the word, you tell the flesh to shut up. You start controlling it instead of it controlling you and you make it shut up. And you, you, you take authority over that disobedience that kept bombarding your thinking process. Is anybody listening? Now, with that in mind, I want to take this weapons and I want to expand it to the fights that you will have ahead of you. Remember, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. In order for that to happen, I need one more week with you. Were you all right for next week? Can we do that next week? And I know that, <laughs> I just love these verses. How many have had a motor called your life that you have just done your way until it, and the manufacturer, aren't you grateful the manufacturer said, listen, I'll take care of you. I'll replace all of the parts and I'll give you a new heart. But you're going to have to not put that wrong fuel in it anymore. You're going to have to put in the things of the Lord. Next week I'll show you how to do that. Is that okay? All right, come on, give the Lord a great big praise. Woo! That's right. Good stuff. I want you to know I love you guys. You were great. So I'm just going to let you go tonight. Is that okay? Why? So should we just stand? Let me just bless you. And, uh, look at you. Look at you. For those of you who don't know what we're doing right now, listen closely. Let me tell you what's happening. We want to make sure that everybody's okay with God before you leave. Nothing could be worse then you coming into the house of God, hearing the word of God. You were great listening to the word of God. We had some fun listening to the word of God. And you were great. But here's my deal. Here's my deal. My deal is this. I want to make sure that if you died tonight, you're going to heaven. Just want to make sure. So let me ask you this question. What makes you think that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven? What makes you think that? 
Answer that in your heart. Nobody will know the answer but you and God. Let's talk about it just for a moment. And then I'll let you go. Is that okay? What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Someone says, well, pastor, I'm a really good person. I'm going to get to heaven because I'm good. The problem with that is nowhere in the Bible does it say you get to go to heaven because you're good. It's not in the Bible. Some of you might say, well, I love God a whole lot. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. I'm going to go to heaven because I love God. Can I tell you something? It's not in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible says because you love God, you get to go to heaven. Not in the Bible. You're not going to make it. Somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, hold on just a moment. You know, I think that if I died, I think I'd make it. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can have positive thinking and get you to heaven. Maybe your answer was, well, you know, Pastor Jim, my mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. They had me christened or baptized when I was a baby. Took me to catechism class or Sunday school class or Sabbath school class when I was a child. Hey, that's great. But did you know that nowhere in the Bible says your mom and dad tell you you're a Christian, makes you a Christian, takes you to those classes, have you christened or baptized as a baby? Maybe you put a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck as a child. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible says that'll get you to heaven? If you're going to get to heaven, you're going to have to get to heaven Jesus' way. Not my way, not your way, but Jesus' way. Jesus said these words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. You can't make it any other way. Can't make it your way, some well-meaning church committee's way, my way. We're going to have to make it to heaven his way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. John 3rd chapter. He said, you must be born again. It's interesting he says this to a guy that is just really a, the best guy you could ever imagine. His name was Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a leader of his church, the synagogue. Why he took care of the poor, fed the poor, was merciful, wore ecclesiastical robes. He was just fantastic. Memorized scripture, quoted scripture, debated scripture, sang the scripture, sang the scripture. How many of you have sung scripture all your life? Nicodemus did. I would have thought for sure that Jesus would have come up to Nicodemus, patted him on the back and said, you know what, Nicodemus, you've done so many good things. You're going to love heaven and heaven's going to love you. I would have thought Jesus would have done that, but he doesn't. Comes to Nicodemus, uses it as an example in the scripture for you and I today so we don't miss out. He comes up to Nicodemus, he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now when I use those words, born again, immediately people turn off because we've been in America taught that born again people are idiots and radicals and crazy fanatical goofball people, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. What Jesus is talking about is simply this. Here's what born again means. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. Always has been, always will be. All or nothing. I'm telling you the truth and I'll prove it to you by the scripture in just a moment. All or nothing. And you're going to have to give him all of your heart. You're going to have to give him all of your life. He won't steal it from you. He's not a thief. He's not a crook. He's not a conniver. He's not a manipulator to talk you out of it. It's your heart and your life and it's your free will choice to give him all of your heart and give him all of your life. But in order for you to get to heaven, it's an all or nothing relationship and I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Do you know what he just really said? He said these words. Listen to the words. He said, people that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all, and they're not going to make it. I'm going to expel them from my body. I will vomit them from my mouth. Lukewarm, let's define it so you know what it means. Tell me if this fits. Little in little out. Little up, little down. Watch this. Token prayer, occasional church attendance. Hey, watch this. Lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Lukewarm. You're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. He's just something. Can I tell you something? He'll never be something until you make him everything. And that's what born again is all about. It's your call. It's your choice. It's the very first right side thing you do in order to have life. 
is receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. And here you are tonight in this safe, friendly place. We've laughed, we've clapped, we've sung songs. Great time in the Word with you. Why leave this place, die, and go to hell? Why not make sure you're going to heaven by giving God all of your heart and all of your life? You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Well, let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. So in a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up, and I'll see it, okay? I'll see your hand go up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I want to give Jesus all of my heart, give Jesus all of my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence and hell. I'll see your hand go up, and then you can put it right back down. It's that simple. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, come on, you know who you are. Back in that family room, I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. You know who you are if you've not given him all of your life. If you're one of those people that are in here and you're not sure, make sure tonight is your night of salvation. God brought you here. You have a divine appointment with God. Tonight, here we are in this safe, friendly place. Sit there and stare at me left side and end up in death and hell our right side get your hand up let me see it in a moment i'll count to three pop my hands together all across this auditorium it's your call you say wait a minute pastor wait a minute i'll be embarrassed if i raise my hand people will see me people behind me people i came with i'll feel funny yep you might get over it better to feel funny in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people see, think and see instead of what God sees. Today, it's your day of an appointed time, your day of salvation. Today, don't miss this appointment with God. I'm counting to three. Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five. Thank you. Six back over here. Seven back in that family room. Eight back over on this side. Thank you. Nine. Thank you. Ten. Thank you. Eleven back in that family room. Twelve right over here. God bless you. Anybody else? Real quick. Real quick. If I didn't see your hand, let me see it. There's another one over here somewhere. There's 13. Thank you. Back over here. There's 14 back there. God bless you. There's another one back in the family room. 15. God bless you. Thank you. Anybody else? There's 15 wise people going for Jesus tonight. Isn't that great news? 15 wise people say, I'm going to get on the right side, not the left side. Well, go ahead and give the Lord a great big praise for 15 wise people. Now, here's what I want you to do from the family rooms. Hear me now. A lot of you from the family rooms, raise your hands. Why don't you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend, get your stuff, bring your kids. Why don't you get out of your seat, ushers? I want you to go up in the family rooms and help them. Bring all their stuff. They have family up there. They're, they're all up there get, help them with their stuff. Get out of your seat. Get in the aisles. Every one of you that raised your hands, no one leave during this period of time. If you raise your hand, you're serious about God. If you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, you can come too. Just bring a friend. You get up here right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Won't you come? Come on, come on. As you are. Oh, and he Won't you come just as you are? Come and see. Come and receive. Come on, not too late for you to hurry, hurry, hurry. Oh, they're coming. Give my hand as they come. Oh, they're coming. Give my hand as they come. Just taste the living water, and you'll never thirst. 
Thank God you guys have come. It's more like 25 of you than 15. But thank God you've come. Put a smile on your face. This is a this is a good thing. It's not a bad thing. And I want you to look to your left. See this guy waving at you. His name is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. No weird stuff goes on, I promise you. He's going to do three things. One, he's going to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You've got to invite him into your heart. That's number one. Number two, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature. Take it home, read about what to do next now that you're a Christian. He'll give it to you free. And then number three, he'll introduce you to a program that we have to help you get strong in Jesus so you don't go back and fall through the cracks. We don't want you to do that. We want to help you get strong. It's called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You'll meet them before church service. Let them spend money on you so that you can just get into things. They'll pray for you during the week. They'll be a friend and help you out as you go forward with God. Let us help you go forward with God. Is that okay? Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Dave right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great...